All right. It is not Tuesday night, but Wednesday night. We had an audible call, and Chris has stepped up to the plate. So thank you, Chris. Guys, I've got Chris Coran from, oh, just from way back in the day in my years, but he's present. And he is the district attorney, soon to be, we hope, soon to be circuit judge. Chris, how are you doing tonight, bud? I sure appreciate you coming on. Bernard, doing great. Great to see you again. Well, I was so glad we were able to catch up a little bit back in the spring at the baseball games. It's good to see you in person. And I uh, hope, I hope, because I know you're going to have one in Tuscaloosa. We'll get to uh, see each other much more as, as time goes on. I want to welcome Jarrell Jackson is with us tonight. Chris, before we get in the Wayback Machine and find out what all kind of trouble that you used to get into <laughs> Now, granted, I realize it's election season, and this is going to be a public docu a public video, so we'll we'll be kind. Absolutely. And I haven't cleared with our Tennessee lawyers whether all the statute of limitations have cleared for everything. So, again, keeping that in mind. <laughs> How are you doing tonight, bud? Talk to doing us. Doing great. Tell us what's going on in your world. Bring us, catch us up to speed with your family and and work that I kind of spilled the beans a little bit about. You know, doing great. It. it um... I'm back home, living in my hometown of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Most people realize it's about an hour north of Nashville, Tennessee. It has really turned into a suburb of Nashville now. Yeah. Every, I'm sorry. Everything is a suburb of Nashville. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it is amazing now how many people that we have. We're, we're the fastest growing area in the state of Kentucky, and we have people moving in constantly from California, Texas, all over uh, to work in Nashville. We've got a, you know, a decent, uh, a, a nice cost of living, good education. So people are just flocking uh, toward mm -hmm. here. So um, to kind of catch you up on where I've, where I've been and where I am uh, after college, uh, after working for a few years uh, in Nashville, uh, I was working in the investment banking uh, industry and really enjoyed uh, decided to go back to law school, uh, mm -hmm. thought that I would um, get a, a law degree as well as a, a LLM in securities law. I thought I was going to stay in the financial world. Um, but, you know, it's funny how things kind of change along the way. Uh, I've clerked for several firms uh, in Birmingham. I went to law school at Samford University, mm -hmm. Cumberland School of Law in Birmingham. Uh, I think you and I ran into each other at a softball game one time when I was in law school. So, um, really enjoyed Birmingham, got to do a lot of different uh, clerkships, uh, everything from criminal defense to, to plaintiff's law to insurance defense and everything in between, and re really quickly realized I wanted to do um, litigation. I wanted to be in the courtroom. I think for all of us that have grown up playing athletics, the, you know, the competition and, and that part of it really drew me towards it. So. Um, after law school, I finished, uh, thankfully, a Vanderbilt alumnus, uh, uh, Roger May, who was a qu quarterback back mm -hmm. in the 60s for Vanderbilt, and mm -hmm. is a good friend of mine to this day. Roger really uh, didn't know him at the time, reached out through our alumni connections, and Roger really helped me uh, along the way. Roger's the man that anytime you see a Titan or a country music star arrested for about anything, Roger's going to be their attorney in Nashville. Uh, big client list has done really well. Um, he knew I wanted to be in litigation, recommended I start out at the public defender's office doing mm -hmm. defense work in Nashville. Uh, within about nine months, I was doing class A felony trial work. Uh, and wow. it was really trial by fire. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of looked at it's almost like um, a residency for law school sure. from that standpoint. Um, after a couple of years of doing that, my wife and I were living in, in Nashville. My wife's originally from Huntsville, Alabama. She's got a doctorate. She's a pharmacist, got her PharmD at Samford. Uh, mm -hmm. We met while I was in law school. Uh, we were living in Nashville, and I got offered a job to come back home uh, as an assistant Commonwealth's attorney, which is mm -hmm. our Commonwealth's attorney is basically everybody else's uh, mm -hmm. attorney. So, I got offered a job to come back home to prosecute cases, which is something I'd always thought about doing. And um, I'd only been back about two years. I was actually the low man on the letterhead 
uh, so to speak. And I showed up to work one day and my boss at the time said, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, okay, what's up? And he said, uh, the bad news is I'm leaving. I'm going to run for circuit judge. Mm -hmm. I said, what's the good news? And he said, well, the good news is you're going to become the next Commonwealth's attorney. And I was like, I was a little stunned at the time. Cause like I How said, old were you? Uh, I was 32 at the time. Wow. And like I said, we had 20 plus year practicing lawyers working in the office, but um, Steve Wilson, who uh, was my boss at the time, um, was a big believer that um, whoever was boss needed to be able to try any case in the office. And I, I yeah. was blessed that I tried a lot of high profile uh, cases early on, mm -hmm. which earned my respect, I think, within our bar. So in 2003, uh, I ran for election as Commonwealth attorney for the first time mm -hmm. pretty handily. And since then, I've never had another contested election. So Perfect. either I've done a good job or nobody else was crazy enough to want the gig. Well, uh, and then as you Chris, touched on briefly, I'm about to uh, make a change again. Well, Chris, you've gotten some attention. I'll give you some last names. Let me know if you've prosecuted any of these guys in the last 20 years. Last name is Small. First name, Clint. Also known as Biggie. Always good to hear from him. Last name is Akos. First name is Pat. And I'm not sure he admits to being with some of those country music stars or titans when they've gotten uh, in trouble. But I'm you, just going to leave it at that. You know, the good thing with Pat and Clint is... Uh, it goes back to the political science days at Vanderbilt where we learned about mutually assured destruction. <laughs> so I think if Pat or Clint decide to get too verbal, I, I know their wives very well and um, can share a lot of stories with them. Well, I, I, I'm not going to repeat what ACOS is just, I'm going to let you get in the comments afterward. I'll let you guys I, I continue that because we're going to quickly derail this. It, it's now a, uh, it's now getting into a state of Kentucky thing. And uh, anyway, Coach Gary Shepard says to tell you hello. Hey, Coach. Good to it's see always you. Always great guys. to hear from Coach Shep. Great guy. I, I tell you what, it, it's, I've got such great memories uh, mm -hmm. staff. Um, you know, Watson Brown is, you know, of all the people I met in college athletics throughout the years, mm -hmm. through recruiting while we were playing and even afterwards with all the connections you make along the way. Um, you know, guys like Gary Shepard and Watson Brown and Antooth mm -hmm. and, and obviously Rick Christoffel, who, you know, I was so happy. And I'm sure all of us just enjoyed being able to, have, you know, take a scintilla of enjoyment, getting to watch Rick Christoffel win a Super Bowl ring mm -hmm. last season. You know, you just sit there and think about how great those guys were. You know, we were we were just so young and so immature and so dumb and, and having those coaches that were so, um, so good to us and, and really cared mm -hmm. uh, versus a lot of, you know, what you see in coaching even then um, versus what you see now. I just, I, I, I'll never get over how good those guys were, you know, um, guys like Tom Goode, who, who was our offensive line coach, Steve Sloan, who if there's a classier individual on the planet, I'd like to see that. You know, I, 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 I tell you one story about Watson not too long ago. Um, Rob Jewell, who was a, a defensive lineman from Horse Cave, Kentucky. Uh, we had him and Brandon uh, Justice who roomed together, who I think Akis nicknamed he and Hall because <laughs> they were both such country bumpkins. Um, Rob Jewell was a, a mountain of a man, mm -hmm. at least. And a few years back, I ran into Rob at, at a fundraiser um, for, for um, court-appointed special advocates. You're familiar with that. That's people that go out of their way to help um, kids that are that are subject to abuse and, and really try and help them in the court system. I ran into Rob Jewell, and, and you know, 
it's the memories you have. He, he came up, gave me a great big hug. And when somebody's bigger than I am in a room and comes up and hug me, to say it got a few people's eyes turned was nothing. Uh-huh. But I saw Rob, it, it was in, in November, and bless his heart, he was beat red and sweating profusely, and I, I was worried about him. And not long after that, bless his heart, he was going to work one morning and he literally bent over to tie his shoes and and dropped dead and went to the funerals. His parents are just such wonderful folks. So well respected in South central Kentucky. But I remember not long after that, um, I, I called, called coach Brian, uh, to, to let him know that, that Rob had, had passed. And I was just amazed talking to Watson um, he was obviously devastated that Rob had passed away, but immediately after that, he went into, it was obviously that he had followed what I had done professionally and kind of kept up and, and you know, to say I was not a player worth keeping up with was an understatement. To watch Watson, you know, who truly cared to go out of his way, you know, he was like, I'm just so proud of you know, all my boys, you know, that you got elected and you're the prosecutor now and mm-hmm. you probably talked for 20 or 30 minutes and, and, you know, just amazing people we were blessed uh, to deal with. And I hope for my children, they're, they're half as blessed as I've been about some of the people they've met along the way. You know, Chris, it, it, it it's so generous and kind hearted for you to say those things. I know they're heartfelt or you wouldn't have said them, but that group of men who were our coaches back then, they took a bunch of 18 year old knuckleheads and turned them into men. Yeah. We, you know, at the end of the day, it's not all the wins or the losses or those things. It's what did you do with your time while you were there? Did you waste it or did you make the most of it? Did you make memories? Did you make friendships, relationships, or did you just pass through and take up some space? And I think the people who got the most out of it are those people who now have these memories, who now have these reflections like you just had and that you continue to have and these relationships that you've built. So it's very kind of you to say that, but I do know you wouldn't have said it had you not felt it. No, and and like I said, I I look back at, you know, you're right, the wins and losses, you know, I'm led by the statement, the older I get, the better I was. And, you know, we can all embellish and do what we need to do. But I look back at those times and I appreciate them even more now, the older that I've got. Mm-hmm. Um, so I look back at it now and just the people we meet, met along the way. Mm-hmm. And I, I've loved your series, um, hearing from these guys. And I, the name I've got to bring up because it's, Lord, I think it's brought up every broadcast. A guy like Brad Bates. Mm-hmm. Brad Bates, to say he truly cared, doesn't even put into words. He just loved all the guys. And I mean, and he was Mm -hmm. one of those, he knew when to kick you in the ass and he knew when to put his arm around you and pat you on the back. Mm -hmm. You know, the misery that he put us through physically and, (laughs) and smiled all along the way. Oh, a devilish grin, a, a, a devilish, um, just, I don't even say, know how to describe it. Say the it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can remember sitting in the locker room during winter conditioning, and you never knew what was going to happen. Yeah. That, yeah. Was even, that was even a worse part about it. You know, yeah. you're going to end up, um, since Akis is on, uh, a great memory of his, where you're going to have to go into the locker room and leg press your body weight 100 times. Were you going to have to go into the auxiliary gym mm-hmm. and 100 half court sprints? You know, and I remember guys cramping up. You know, I remember, you know, just some of the, the studs we played with. You know, guys like, and I'll bring Anthony Carter, one of the kindest, you know, nicest guys you ever meet, who had about 0.1% body fat. And I can remember Bates running everybody in the ground where he literally went into a full body cramp. Mm-hmm. but but you know brad bates is just such a just what a great guy you know and, and i think it's funny the older i get 
and, and I've watched both my kids in athletics and, and so many of the things that I'll talk to them about are things that I learned from, from those wonderful people uh, at Vanderbilt. And, and I think you can appreciate this. When, when I was in law school in Birmingham, um, when I started applying for jobs and clerkships, I, I can't tell you how many times I got offered interviews and clerkships and jobs from people based on the fact that, you know, they would say, I, I wanted to interview because you're a Vanderbilt football player. Mm -hmm. You know, my God, these were diehard Alabama and Auburn and Georgia fans, but they would sit there and go, we've got nothing but respect for you all. What you all go through academically and athletically, you know, is just different. And, and it was very good to me. Uh, it's been very good to me professionally. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure it has you. Um, and I just think, like I said, back on it with, with such fond memories and, and so blessed. And it's rare a day goes by. I don't talk to somebody from the Vanderbilt days. Mm -hmm. you know, thank God for, for social media and mm -hmm. messaging. And, and it's, uh, I've got a text string with a group of guys that, like I said, I talk to pretty much every day. Oh, that's, that's so great. That's what this is about, building community, reconnecting with old teammates, making new friendships through teammates. And I don't know how you want to take this, but Pat says that now you are way better looking than you were in college. So I don't want to misquote him. Hey, you can go I'll back to the it. comments. I'll take it. You know, Chris, uh, let's talk about growing up in Bowling Green. Sure. How did you not end up in Kentucky, Louisville, University of my, you know, Ohio, somewhere else besides Nashville? You know, it was funny. Um, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, when I was 15 years old, the summer when I was 15, which I guess is right before my junior year, mm -hmm. I went from six foot one to six foot five in three months went from a size 10 shoe to a size 14 shoe in three months and literally could not walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Being in Kentucky back then, you know, before video games and yeah. phones, if we had a spare moment, we were playing pickup basketball Yeah, and playing pickup basketball with, you know, as we did for hours and hours every day, really got my, my agility where, where it needed to be. Um, I, I was, it was kind of a unique, unique standpoint. I did not like UK growing up. I was one of you, all my friends were diehard UK fans. Uh, my dad went to dental school at the University of Louisville. Um, mm -hmm. Back then, U of L was a commuter school. It, it was not somewhere you would have even considered, or most people wouldn't consider going to. It was but, a basketball school, really, in the yeah, 80s, that was it. 90s. They and played at the far how far is Bowling Green from both of those campuses? Uh, I'm about an hour and a half from U of L and mm -hmm. a hour from UK. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be honest, when I started getting recruited, when my recruiting kind of blew up for me, um, I immediately was very respectful to UK because it was the flagship um, university for the state and just um, mm -hmm. let them know I had no interest. Mm -hmm. That really made some people mad. My high school football coach played at UK and was a, a diehard UK alumnus. Wow. It caused that caused a bit of a rift, but um, I knew I did not want to go to UK. Um, I was very blessed um, to have a bunch of offers, a wide range of schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, everything from Alabama and Tennessee. Um, um, schools like that to Harvard and Yale in the Ivy League. So it, it's funny looking back at it. My mom saved almost every recruiting letter I ever got in their boxes. Uh, and it's funny because um, my kids want to get all of them now. Um, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. My sister had gone to Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and I'd spent some time up east and really enjoyed. Um, going up east, I loved Harvard. You know, Harvard was Harvard, and it was very hard to turn down. 
Um, I grew up an Alabama football fan, like most kids in the South, just because that was the only game that was on TV most of the time. Mm -hmm. And when I got offered by Alabama, it was very tough to turn down. Um, but I was really lucky from this standpoint. Um, the, the greatest player in the history of my high school is a guy named Dale Lindsay. Uh, he graduated from Bowling Green High in 1961. He was uh, a first team parade All American out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, signed at Arkansas, and ended up finishing at Western, Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green. Dale played um, about 12 years for the Cleveland Browns. All right. His best friend from the time he was six years old was my dad. So I grew up with, grew up around Dale. And at the time uh, he had coached multiple stops, both college and pro. Mm -hmm. And he was very involved in my recruiting from the standpoint that, that um, he would look at me and go, remember, you need to make sure at the end of four years, you're walking out with a degree that truly means something. Mm -hmm. You're not a freak of God. And your dad's not going to let you be a freak of chemicals. So um, he said, make sure four years from now, you're walking out with a piece of paper that'll mm -hmm. be where you need to go. And um, we had a lot of ties to Vanderbilt. My mom got her master's uh, while I was in high school. She got her MBA at uh, the Owen School of Management. Mm -hmm. Vanderbilt really, it was an hour from home and it really, uh, it, for me, it was the best of both worlds. I'd watch my dad, yeah. my sister through Brown, and my mom through Vanderbilt Graduate School and just work nonstop. And I thought, you know, going to be hard to find something that beats a full ride to Vanderbilt. Yeah. Had, had you not gone to Vanderbilt, what was your number two or number three? Or, or yeah. was there? Uh, did you ever get I, to that point? Yeah. You know, the coach from Harvard called me the day I left, the day before I left to Vanderbilt and mm -hmm. said, have a spot and that was really hard the the other school i really liked other than alabama during recruiting uh was the university of south carolina i went down to columbia really enjoyed it great campus ridiculous facilities mm -hmm. uh, it, it had an honors college it was one of the first southern schools to have an honors college um, and really enjoyed it and, and it was interesting um, i'll never forget my mom at the time smoked like a chimney and Saturday night we had dinner with the head coach who was Jim Morrison I think some people will remember him as the head coach of South Carolina and he and my mother sat there and chain smoked at dinner non-stop and I'll never forget we flew home on Sunday and uh Monday night, I got a phone call um from the offensive coordinator at South Carolina who informed me that it was about ready to hit ESPN, Coach Morrison had died of a heart attack, which the way he chain smoked made a lot of sense. Wow. So when he died of a heart attack, that kind of took South Carolina. They were in turmoil after that. And um, I, the next week I took my visit to Vanderbilt. Uh, Bobby Craycraft um, was my host. and Kentucky uh, boy. Kentucky boy, not by accident, good Ashland guy. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, you know, Bobby was such a, as we all know, what a great guy. He was very good to me. Um, he was very honest with me during recruiting. Didn't sit there and try and, you know, the, try and pitch you to make sure you came. He and I sat in his room in towers, you know, several hours talking about, pluses and minuses and what he liked and what he didn't. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, meeting guys like Bobby Craycraft, mm -hmm. Pearson, who just the most mature <laughs> I'd ever met. Yeah. Yeah. He was a 40 year old man when he was 22 years old. That's right. You know, Greg Smith and John Denardi and Kevin Dowling and, you know, all those guys were, were, um, very quickly, you find, you know, I'm a big believer in what water rises to its own level. And I felt at home with those guys. And my recruiting class, we had a great group of guys. We're, we're still very close uh, and keep in touch. And it was, um, 
you know, it's kind of funny. You tell people it sounds corny. You kind of, you'll know it when you find it. Uh, I knew very quickly that, that once I, um, it started to kind of settle in, I, I knew Vanderbilt was going to be the place for me. You know, and it's, it's, it can go very quickly one way or the other. You know, it, it's, you can get into a situation and, and into a, a particularly one that's stressful coming into the SEC, coming into Vanderbilt with the academics, coming into playing college SEC football that's at the highest level and still trying to have a little bit of a social life or, and sleep a little bit. Combining all of that, your freshman year is not easy. And it's it. What is easy is the default that you get overloaded, and you end up with a 1.1 GPA, and you're out of school, or you're on academic probation, or you do something dumb like uh, cheat on a test or something. And I'm not saying any of this is your experience. I'm just saying navigating that world as a 18 year old or so freshman coming in to play ball can be tricky, and. Chris, how did you how did you weave your way through that first year to just not only survive it, but then to start to thrive, not just football wise, but all aspects of college life? How did you deal with that? Yeah, you know, my roommate did not last after uh, after our freshman year. Mm -hmm. He had a great guy named Greg Jones mm -hmm. in um, from Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm wasn't right for him and that, yeah. where, where did Greg end up I, I remember Greg as a freshman he played tight end at Mississippi State that's he, right thank you I remember it's another SEC school he actually grew up near Watson mm -hmm. and Watson was coaching at Rice so sure, sure sure and followed kind of kept in touch and Watson had followed him and Greg was a great athlete mm -hmm. and, and Watson ended up offering him to come up to Vandy Greg was a great guy Football mm -hmm. athlete, yeah, ended up putting on a bunch of weight when he got to Mississippi State and mm -hmm. played a bit at tight end. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done real well for himself. He's yeah. well in business, great family. Uh, you know that's one of the great things about social media. I'll still hear from him every now and then. So oh, that's great. That's yeah, great. Um, you know I was lucky. Um, you know your class kind of, you know you come in with twenty five to 30 guys, including walk-ons, mm -hmm. things kind of start settling in pretty quick. Uh, I was lucky. We had just, it, our class was never really factionalized. Mm -hmm. They got along really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I live next door to, to Sam Chalmers uh, and DJ Bradley, who were great mm -hmm. guys. Uh, you know, I had um, right below us, Pat Akis and then Chris Donnelly, who ended up transferring to Alabama and starting safety on their uh, national championship team, yeah. 1990. Um, we were close. Tom Vincent uh, mm -hmm. lives about 30 minutes from me still. Uh, he was, was a freakish athlete mm -hmm. and great guy. Uh, we are still very close. Um, and I think early on, you know, a lot of guys were just trying to survive. I think at times it was really harder on the guys that were dressing and playing early as freshmen. Oh, sure. They got thrown twice into the fire. Yeah. Where at least we had a little bit of a time, those that were red-shirted, to, to kind of adapt and level off a little bit and, and even um, find your way into the, the Vanderbilt, you know, the normalcy of Vanderbilt for what it was. Yeah. Uh, as a student, um, I think you got to see a little bit of everything else, but um, I, I think what made it so doable for, for, for me, like I said, going back to the coaching staff, you know, Brad Bates, um, everything from Brad Bates to June Jakes and Beverly Brothers, mm -hmm. those people that just went out, you know, went out of their way to take care of you yeah. uh, close on you. And, and I was very lucky. Um, my dad would show up the campus from time to time and you know I, I was very blessed to have my family close enough that when I when I wanted to see them I could and had that support system uh, I remember my sophomore year uh, Thanksgiving fell on the Thursday 
uh, before we played Tennessee that year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, and, and I think this is such a great memory. I remember I took about 18 to 20 guys up to Bowling Green. Oh, wow. Uh, Thanksgiving and we had guys from all different classes and yeah. you know it was good about making sure everybody had a place mm -hmm. Thanksgiving that year well I you bet know, that was a sight rolling up to your house oh man it was funny I mean because I remember we we practiced that morning and then had the afternoon off mm -hmm. and it divided where we were gonna you know make sure everybody had a ride somewhere mm -hmm. uh, I think that year my mom cooked like four turkeys um had another four honey baked tams and wow food. Boy, and that's just, some memories right there. Uh, I bet. And it just got devoured, but you know, I, I look back at the guys that came up to Bowling Green with me and, you know, these were guys from, you know, every different race, yeah. demographic, geographic area you could ask for. And, and everybody just, you know, to, you know, just really enjoyed each other's company and, and just such a great class of people. You know, Chris, that's the beauty of, of team sports. That's the beauty of teammates. That's, as you just mentioned, you didn't care where they were from. They were a Commodore. They were your teammate. They were your brothers in arms. And even now, you spoke of it several times about how close you are with many of the guys, either in your recruiting class or who you became close with on the team. But Pat says, Thor and Aronauts, who were both in my recruiting class, oh, kept, kept it real. And that's, and I want to tell this to Pat and others. I can't tell you how many conversations that I had with several of the guys in my recruiting class, including Thor and Aronauts, about that very thing, about the realness of playing Vanderbilt football, of playing SEC, playing college football, the rigors of it. And I know there's been books written about it, uh, people sharing their experience, but unless you live it, unless you go through it and experience it, you don't truly understand what it what it takes to not just survive it at the beginning, but to thrive at, at the end. And look what you've done with your career. And that is in part by some of the legwork and the groundwork, if you will, that you laid, not just growing up in Bowling Green, but your time at Vanderbilt and how you made the most of it and then going on to Samford uh, and then going on to, to your professional career. That's why, Chris, that's why I like, no, that's why I love having these conversations each week. It's learning the journeys. It, yeah. it is. It, it was funny. We were on vacation last week down on 30A in Florida. <laughs> I was out in, the, out in the ocean with my son. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to be a freshman in high school this year. And um, he started, we got home on uh, Sunday night. He was playing travel baseball on the way back, but his first high school football practice was Monday, right when we got back. Uh -huh. And he was nervous about it. I mean, we all remember that, those, those days. And I just remember, you know, sitting down and talking with him and trying to um, hopefully give him a little bit of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so much of it is regurgitating what we learned along the way from our teammates and our coaches. Mm -hmm. I just said, you know, there's going to be some brutal times, you know, and there's going to be some times that you are, um, it, it's a tough sport made for tough people. Uh, and it's not for everybody. Yeah. And, and I've told him, I said, make sure you're playing for you. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're playing for you and your teammates. Cause if you don't love it, and one day that love, you know, will get extinguished. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's what you want to do. Put your heart and soul into it, you know, and you're going to have, you know, memories that'll make a life you know, that'll last a lifetime. You know, not only, you know, I've been so blessed, not only, you know, have I had so many lifelong friends, you know, um, to, to, to stay in touch with from college, you know, I'm close to a lot of guys I played with and, high school and you know it, it's funny you still run into guys you see that you play peewee with or against and i sure hope you don't end up prosecuting any of those guys but i've had to do that more than a few times i was gonna say it's just yeah. nature of your job and the size of your your community 
Uh, but I do want to welcome Billy Smith, one of the beloved Keystone Cops, has joined us. And good, good to see him on here. What and a guy, pair. What a great guy. And a pair of the 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 most steadiest hands out of the state of Ohio. Number seven, Tom Fitz, one of my teammates. Hey, there you go. Hey, Tom, thank you for joining us. I'd love for you to come on the show sometime. As I'm talking with Chris Coran. Chris, life in Kentucky is, is largely from a sports world. Historically, it's about basketball. You know, that's the, the not the birthplace of the sport, but I'm sure the proud Blue Nation will, will claim that it, it is. It may not have been born here, but they'll tell you it was perfected here. <laughs> that's exactly That's exactly right. However, I will say over the last decades, Kentucky has had some good years. Louisville's had some good years. Vanderbilt has played Western Kentucky. Some of the other programs, you know, the small schools are starting to build, build up. Here's my question for you in, in Bowling Green. And I'm not necessarily talking about your son or his high school, but are you seeing the Vanderbilts of the world making more headway in recruiting kids out of the state of Kentucky? Or are they largely staying home, staying in the state at one of those institutions? You know, I think uh, you, you still see UK and U of L. Mm -hmm. uh, I think just due to academics, uh, the a little bit easier road to get people in. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing still in Kentucky. Um, you know, we've had some great players, both basketball, football, and, and baseball, mm -hmm. come from the state of Kentucky to Vanderbilt. I think for for a lot of kids growing up in Kentucky that are high academic kids, I think Vanderbilt is still very much um, a, a top draw for these kids. Um, I think it, it is a place kids want to go to. I think it's an easier recruit now more than ever because, you know, Nashville is just the epicenter of everything it seems like uh, growth-wise uh, in, in the South and kind of one of the it cities in the United States. Um, I, I, I'm very, uh, you, you know, I think all of us, you know, we, we still try and follow it as close as we can. I, I was very glad to see Coach Lee uh, mm -hmm. the job. Um, I, I think for the first time, uh, it's a really good marriage. I think, you know, the background he came from, I think he's got some opportunities uh, and I think you're seeing it recently with some of the commits we've seen at Vanderbilt. I, I think he's got a real opportunity if everybody will be patient um, and, and give him the time. Uh, there's no reason Vanderbilt shouldn't be on par sports-wise. And, and I think the model is Stanford uh, we've seen for several years. Um, you know, am I expecting us to be in a BCS game? In four years, no, but I don't think there's any reason why we can't compete nationally for recruits. I mean, my son a couple of years ago went down to Tim Corbin's baseball camp, and um, to see what Corbin has done, obviously baseball is a little bit of a different animal. Yeah. It goes without saying, but to see what Coach Corbin's been able to do, I think if it doesn't give you the blueprint, and I know he and Coach Lee are, are, are very close. I think it's going to give him a lot of direction on, on how to grow the program. Um, and like I said, I, I, I'm, I still get contacted a lot from, from kids, you know, in our area that go through recruiting and, mm -hmm. and questions about it and, and different things. And, and I, I still think the Vanderbilt brand is one that still carries a lot of cachet. I, I couldn't agree with you more, particularly Coach Corbin is the gold standard. Yeah. Not just with baseball, but I think he is accomplished at Vanderbilt in the last 20 years of his tenure as much as any college coach on any sport. And maybe that's a little bit of a, of a loft by me, but other than Coach Saban, I want you to find me another coach who's done what he's done and put yeah. – He's put more Vandy boys in the pros. This year, Vanderbilt has had more players reach the MLB level and play than any other school in the country. 
I think today we had our 30th player get called up to the majors. I, I did see that. I did see that. That's Will Toffee. Yeah, um, which is great. Chris, what gives you the most satisfaction, the most joy, the most pride on being a Vanderbilt grad, a Vanderbilt ball player now in your current your current life? <laughs> you know, I, I, it, for me, it's been something that, that – um, it's treated me very well. Um, I think people, when they realize not only did you go to Vanderbilt and graduate, but you were part of that football program, um, I think it, it instantly gives you a lot of credibility. Um, you know, you've got to have the work ethic. If you don't have the work ethic, you're not going to survive. And I think it, it, again, people realize that, that if you are able to accomplish that, you're going to be able to do just about anything. And, um, the competitive part of it and the tough days we dealt with and everything, you know, in my career, um, trying, uh, trying cases now for almost 25 years to jury trials, you know, it's very much an athletic event. Uh, you know, the preparation you've got to put into, the work you've got to put into, the leadership you've got to show, with you know your law enforcement agencies and support staff and everything involved plus prepping these cases that um you know sometimes will take uh, you know a capital murder trial for example may take three or four years to get to trial mm -hmm. the preparation you're doing uh for that you know month long or six week long trial yeah uh, is a constant battle. And I can tell you without question, without the athletic background, um, I don't think I would be nearly as successful as I've been in my litigation. Chris, another, another Commodore who tries a lot of jury trials on the civil side out of Huntsville area, Kenny Cole. I bet he would echo those sentiments. Thank you, Kenny, for joining us. We got Brian Diggs. We got Harold Lurcius. Big digs. Who else we got here? That, that, a couple of them have rolled off. But guys, I've got a few more minutes with Chris Coran coming out of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Chris, a, a, a few things that, that I want to ask you about. What advice would you give the 18, 19 year old you that maybe that hopefully your son will appreciate now because you've gone through it? But what advice would you give that version, that that age of yourself? You know, um, my daughter's getting ready to head to the University of Alabama, and she had to make a video. And, and one of the things um, she made put in the video is, um, and I was very honored when she said this, she goes, my dad always taught me to surround yourself with people that make you feel better and not worse. Hmm. And, you know, I've been... I've been so blessed, um, you know, true friendship is, is a hard thing to find. You know, people are so self-serving these days mm -hmm. uh, and narcissistic and mm -hmm. truly care about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've just been so blessed. I've got a group of guys that I grew up with here that I love dearly. And we, we've, you know, watched our kids grow up together and, and lived and died with each other. And, and uh, I was so blessed to not only go from that to college where I found another group that I'm just as close with, you know, Tom Vincent's and Pat Akis's and Clint Small. I talked to Tom Bonhouse almost once a week, you know, I'm sending my daughter down to Tuscaloosa. And one reason I feel so comfortable, even though she's going to be four and a half hours away uh, is, Tom Bonhouse lives five minutes from Alabama's campus. Uh, and there literally there's nothing I couldn't ask of him that he wouldn't do for me. Uh, and probably vice versa as well. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's kind of friends you are. It's kind well, of it, it, you've it, made. We, we've watched each other, you know, and, and I think to me that's the quality of people mm -hmm. that, that we meet along the way and you surround yourself with so important um you know your friends you know are happy when great things happen to you uh, they're not jealous and, and you know i've watched 
the, the trials and tribulations, you know, Pat Akis, who I know is on here, he had a, a brother die in, in the military in a plane crash. And, you know, I hopped on the first plane to be with him at the funeral at Arlington National Cemetery. Um, I can remember Tom Vincent calling me one night, you know, having a hell of a hard time when his wife was really struggling with some health issues. You know, you meet these people along the way that literally would, would lay down and die for you if you asked them to. And to me, you know, money and cars and the material things are, are something that need to be totally secondary. The, the people you meet along the way that you truly love and love you, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Because, you know, it, it, I, I can't tell you how much it means to me when I, when I talk to these guys. Um, back in December, we had a, a horrific tornado hit Bowling Green. It literally jumped over my house, landed in my backyard, it destroyed about an acre of my property. And, you know, I heard from guys all over the country and, you know, social media, one of, the, one of the great things I think about it with it is, you know, when you see something that, that, that happens that's positive for either you or your family, and you look down and you see a comment from Carlos Thomas, I'm going to throw his name out there, mm -hmm. is one of the greatest, funniest, most powerful voices that, that I could ever see come through Vanderbilt. And he's checking on you or he's happy for you. You know, Mike Healy getting to watch it, you know, pictures of his son just recently graduated from, from Clemson. You know, and, and these guys are just, um, you know, I, and I always do this uh, when I hang up and talk to one of these guys. And I'll always just say, great to hear from you, brother, because they are like that. And, and you know, so an 18 year old, you know, in my, as I tell, I'm telling my daughter this as she's going off to college and my son as he's going into high school. Make sure your number one priority is surrounding yourself with people that are going to be good for you uh, and, and help you get to the right direction. Tell me this man right here wasn't a hell of a teammate. Tell me this man right here wasn't the kind of guy you wanted to be. Well, I, I, can't, I, can't give you, I can't give you any any better praise other than to call you friend. And I'm so, Absolutely. I'm so pleased that we've been able to get together a little bit, share a little bit of your journey and guys, these are, this is why I keep coming back each week. These stories need to be told. They need to be shared. You guys need to keep coming back. If I ask you to be on the show and you don't want to be on it, that's fine. That's I'm not, this is all voluntary. We're doing this to, to kind of share the oral history of the program, reconnecting and then connecting from different generations, different years that you play, but we all have the commonality that we're all Commodores. So Chris, you are the, to me, you're the definition of Commodore and a teammate. So my friend, thank you for sharing your sentiments and, and, and all that you have tonight and all that you've done. Uh, honored to be here. You know, and like I said, watching these the, these programs you've put on, you know, I, I hope Coach Lee has gotten a small taste. And I think if he could bottle, you know, what I've seen from these guys that have come mm -hmm. in and, and if he could bottle it and deliver it to these recruits, you know, the sky would be the limit. Just oh, ab absolutely. The, qual uh, the quality of people is second to none. I want to say hey to Dante Ferguson. Hey, Dante, thank you for coming on, bud. But I want you guys to know, toward the end of the football season in December, in November, we're going to call this man the judge. So, Chris, best of yeah. luck in those endeavors. We know you're going to be a hell of a judge, and I know you're looking forward to it. So, best of luck. Uh, much appreciated. Guys, before we get out of here on a little more serious note, Although I never knew him, I certainly followed his career. Obviously, we lost Jimmy Williams this past week. Keep him in your thoughts and prayers and his family. The, the arrangements and all of those things are in there. So many of the teammates have already shared their sentiments and things. Uh, a, a, a tragic loss for the Commodore Nation. He, he'll be missed very much so. Hell of a player. Hell of a player. Lastly, 
If you're going to Hawaii, and I hope you guys are, I put the links in the things that I know that are the organizers, the luau, there's a pregame tailgate. Of course, I've got my CLE, Kenny Cole, and some others are speaking out. I'm so looking forward to this. Can't get Chris to come out there, but I'm going to keep asking him. But if you're going to go, you got to, it's, and the last thing I'll say is we've learned it's not the campus stadium. They've condemned that. It's going to be at a much smaller stadium. So you have to request your tickets. I'm trying to, I think Chris Griffin may be on vacation this week, but I'm going to keep reaching out to him to find out how we can order those tickets because they are going to be limited. It's quite small stadium, but I hope as many Commodores can go as possible to show some pride and to anchor down out in Hawaii. Thank you again, Chris. You guys, we'll see you next week. Anchor down. <laughs>